honor him a rum pa pum pum when we come
yes, God. We love you so much, God. We worship you, Lord. You and only you. Our Father who came as just a little baby to this earth, who had a plan.
Merry Christmas, everyone, and welcome to Keswick Church. We're so glad you joined us today. My name is Mel, and this is your Keswick News. Here at Keswick, we truly believe that we are better together than we are apart. If you're a new guest with us, we'd love for you to stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby after service to fill out one of our Hello Keswick cards and to receive a free gift. Stop by the Giving Tree and help a family in need this Christmas. Simply grab a tag from off the tree, then get either a Fred Meyers or Walmart gift card in that same amount and bring it back to the Welcome Center. All gift cards need to be returned by Sunday, December 19th. To everyone who is a part of Kessid's death ministry and their families, you are invited to celebrate at their Christmas party this Sunday, December 12th at 12.30 p.m. It will be downstairs at Kessid Uptown following the 11 a.m. service and lunch will be provided. There will also be a white elephant gift exchange, so if you'd like to participate, please bring a gift of $10. Parents of students in KSM, Join us for a KSM Parent Pizza Night this Wednesday, December 15th at 7 p.m. Come hear about the vision for 2022 in KSM. Ask any questions you may have and get to know our new youth pastor, Joe, and his family. The Red Envelope Service is a Kessid Christmas tradition. Every year since Kessid first started, we collect a special offering in red envelopes the weekend before Christmas and give it away to a local nonprofit organization in our community. This year, we are happy to announce that we have chosen Transitional Youth as the recipient of our funds. Transitional Youth is a Christian local nonprofit that provides outreach, support, and housing to homeless and at-risk youth. This is an incredibly special tradition and service here at Kesson, and we hope that you'll join us. Our red envelope services will be next Thursday, December 16th, and Sunday, December 19th. Mark your calendars and join us for our candlelight Christmas Eve Eve service on Thursday, December 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Kessid Columbia will be joining Kessid Uptown, so we will have one service celebrating Christmas all together. We hope you'll join us. Make sure to check out your Kessid Church app and kessid.com for more information and to register for these and other events. You can also stay up to date with everything going on here at Kessid by visiting our website, following our Facebook and Instagram page, or by visiting the Welcome Center on Thursdays or Sundays. And if you have any questions, you can always contact us at info at kessidchurch.com. All right, everyone, that's all we have for announcements. Thanks again so much for joining us here at Kesset, and we'll continue with our service shortly. Is it, is it not super magical in here? Does anybody else feel like we should be ice skating right now? I feel like I'm at the ice skating base. Uh, welcome, to, welcome to Kesed. My name is Danny, and I am one of the pastors here. Uh, if you're new, thanks for, thanks for giving church a chance. I recognize that uh, in this world, especially, uh, especially right now, uh, coming together like this uh, can, can feel a little, a little uh, insecure. And I just want to start by saying that uh, you're in a safe space. So we're so excited that you're here. Nothing too weird is going to happen, I promise. Although, uh, although I do, I, I am excited that you came to this service because it's, really, it's a really special service. So that said, I want to start off by uh, talking about one of the things in the announcements we talked about, Red Envelope. Because we do have so many new people in our church, I want to explain that from the beginning of Kesed, we have decided to uh, start a tradition that reminded us as a church that we are not uh, the center of all that God is doing and all that God is in moving within. And so we started giving away what at the time was the single biggest offering of the year uh, to somebody outside of Kesed, somebody outside, maybe even you could say the vision of our church. And we did it through something called a red envelope service. You walk in, every, there's red envelopes on all the chairs and we bring somebody in, somebody usually that has nothing to do with this church. It's just something that some other ministry or movement that God is working in and they share about it, and then we as a church uh, give to them, and 100% of whatever goes in the envelope goes directly to them. There's no, there's no like cut or, or percentage taken out for cost of, of doing the service. The, everything that goes into it, no matter how big or small, is given to them. And it's, it's not only a beautiful thing to do, it's also a really important thing to do, to remember that as exciting as it is to see the church growing, this church growing, as exciting as it is to see how God is moving here 
uh, there's still lots of other beautiful things happening. There's amazing churches here in our town and amazing ministries. And our job is to partner with what God is doing. And uh, it's a really neat way to, uh, to, to lean into that. So I hope you come. I'll be here. I'll be leading it. Um, I'll be here, uh, you know, as a part of it. So uh, come check it out. Bring a friend. It'll be fun. Uh, that said, I want to introduce to you in just a second um, our brand new uh, pastor of student ministries, uh, Joe Borales. Joe, uh, I joked last service, is probably the most prayed for pastor in Clark County because we have been searching and searching and searching. And, and quality youth pastors just don't grow on trees, folks. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta really hunt for those things. And Joe, in this beautiful way, kind of found us and then we found him and then we had this, this connection and then we started dreaming together and he's just, he's just such a great fit. Um, I'm gonna bring him up here in just a second and he's gonna share with you his story and how well it fits inside our series from now to forever. Before I do that, I want to invite you to this Wednesday, uh, a parent youth kind of, kind of a curiosity night. If you're interested in coming with your junior higher or high schooler, or you're interested in volunteering and spending more time with Joe, this Wednesday, we're gonna have a, a whole kind of a group gathering. I'm gonna be there, we're gonna feed everybody, and then uh, Joe's gonna be there with Pastor Keith. We're gonna talk about the student ministry, what we wanna do, maybe a little bit about what you guys wanna do and, uh, and kind of experience what it might look like to, to launch something really, really special in January. So that said, it's not just parents we're looking for. We're also looking for people who just wanna be ministry leaders, just wanna be connected, just wanna serve. And I think after you hear Joe's story, uh, you might, if you're a little on the edge, you might, you might be all the way over. And so if you could put that on your calendars this Wednesday, uh, coming up right here in this building at seven o'clock. Amen? All right. With nothing more to say, I would like you to please give a warm Kessid welcome to Joe Borellis. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Danny said, my name's Joe, and um, we're really excited about being here. You know, uh, my wife and I have been a part of student ministries and youth ministry and kids ministry for the last 10 years. And, uh, and honestly, as we felt kind of God stirring in us that, hey, we, we, we want to find something new. Um, as Danny said, the Lord really brought Kesset up. And one thing that just was really special to us was not just finding a church that cared about people like the masses, but also really cared about individuals. And I can say in our one month here so far, that I have rarely in my entire life felt more cared for. And the amount of people who have gone out of their way to make us feel special from the elders to the pastors and staff to, to even the volunteer leaders and folks who call Kess at home, you are amazing people. And it is such a privilege to come alongside and join the Kessid family. So thank you so much. I, uh, I'm really excited about being here. Um, so really quick, I, uh, one thing I love about youth ministry and student ministries is there's nothing, uh, there, being a teenager is really hard, isn't it? It's like really challenging. And, and I think for me, uh, there's something really beautiful about coming alongside what God's doing in the life of a teenager and helping them see where God's at work in their life. So that's a little bit about what we're going to share today. But before we go in, can I just introduce you to my family really quick? And so, um, really quick, my, uh, I, my wife and I, Rachel and I, have been married for about six years, and we have one daughter, Rory. She's 17 months old, almost 18 uh, months old. And uh, the, the crazy thing is, is uh, one, my wife loves me and forgives me all the time, and I have not seen Jesus more clearly presented than my wife. Um, and she loves a very broken man like me, and I'm, I'm really grateful for her. And my daughter has showed me so much about who God is. It's been amazing. She's taught me more about God and someone who is a year and a half old than anyone I've ever met. <laughs> but um, her full name is actually Aurora um, because my last name is Borellis. So her name is Aurora Borellis. Um, if you don't know, that's a pun. As in, as in her... The Aurora Borealis is the official name for the Northern Lights. And it's not that I wanted to get my daughter made fun of, I promise. I've been wanting to name uh, our, our daughter Aurora for a long time. And, and a big reason why is because the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights, only show up in the coldest, darkest places on our planet. And it's this beautiful light that shows up in the place you would least expect. And for a guy who, who is as broken as me and has seen cold and dark days, 
God brought this beautiful light into my life. So I'm really grateful to be her dad. And even more than that, our family is growing and Rory's excited about being a big sister. And we, have, uh, we are expecting our second child in April. So we are really excited. Um, that's a little bit about us. Yeah. Uh, so when uh, Danny first said, hey, Joe, do you want to be a part of the series? I was really excited because when Danny introed the series from now to forever a few weeks ago, that his idea really was like so provocative to me, this idea of how do you capture moments that last forever? You see, like we all like love Christmas. We cherish it. We work really hard to make it special. But then there's only one Christmas per year. And it feels like there's 364 wasted days outside of that. And we only get like 80 Christmases. <laughs> That's not much. And so for me, it's like, how do we take something as small as these minutes confined to a day and make them moments that we cherish forever? Make them moments that change our lives and the people around us and their lives. How do we do that? And this series became something so special to me to be a part of. And one of the ideas we brainstormed, this next practice that kind of helps us live life and capture these moments is the idea of intentionality. Now, intentionality is not a magical word. It's not this like special idea. All intentionality is is the quality of doing things with purpose or on purpose. And the thing about it is, is uh, I'm not an expert on this. I live most of my days as if my schedule is running me instead of I'm running my schedule, you know? And I'm oftentimes the victim of my circumstances instead of seeing where is God in my circumstances. So I'm not the expert on this. I have a truckload of wasted days in my rear view mirror. I am not the expert. But I can tell you that I am the product of a bunch of men and women in my life who have been incredibly intentional and to me and for me that it has changed my life. So to help you kind of understand what I mean, I'm gonna share a little bit about my story. You see, I am tied for the youngest of four siblings. Uh, this is a picture of us when we were kids. Yes, it's a photo from the early 90s, and it looks like it. <laughs> um, but uh, you'll see I am the, the short one there, in case you didn't realize. And I know the guy on the stage is like this hulking mass of a man, this giant human being who's not five foot six. But, um, <laughs> um, but actually, I've always been the runt of my family. But I will say uh, I have two older siblings. And then I am a twin. And so my twin sister is right next to me. And she may be taller than me in that picture, but I am two hours older than her. And so we have to rub it in her face. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But um, the, the crazy thing for me about uh, having, one of the be biggest blessings in my life is actually um, having a twin sister. Just a quick aside. Um, you see, not only was I the runt, but I was also the most cowardly kid in my family. And so I've always been small. Uh, I didn't outgrow my sister. I didn't get taller than her until I was like a junior in high school. <laughs> and so I've always been this short little kid. And when I was about three or four, my, uh, I was getting picked on by a kid. We were in this kind of rundown neighborhood. And I was getting picked on by this kid. And in that moment, I just decided, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna suddenly gain a bunch of courage and I'm gonna stand up to this kid. And when he was picking on me and pushing me, I got this rush of rage and I was getting ready to explode at him and then suddenly I curl up in a ball and start crying. <laughs> and my twin sister was inside and had come out and found a piece of plywood next to a trash can and came up and hit the kid in the back of the head with it. <laughs> and uh, he actually ran off crying, so. <laughs> um, but no, I'm really grateful to have my twin sister, uh, one, of the, one of the places I see God in my life. But, uh, just a little bit about our upbringing. Um, my older two siblings both uh, have different dads and we have different dads from them and our, they had their dads in their life. But my dad took off long before I was born. And I think for me, I always innately had this sense of there's something wrong with that. Even early on, seeing my older two siblings get to interact with their dad and I would ask questions like, where's my dad? And that began laying the fabric for me of this idea, this concept, this narrative that I was unloved and unwanted. And, and truth be told, that became the dominant narrative of my life. And to add on to that, my mom has struggled with addiction for most of my life. 
Um, she's battled addiction, and, and that has caused her to be in and out of our lives. And, and just a quick aside before I continue on with the story, my mom and my dad are not the villains of my story. They're not the bad guys. Um, if, you, if you've known anyone who's battled addiction, you know that it is one of the toughest fights that a human being can face in this world. And my mom has shown tremendous strength, even in her courage to come here this morning. And uh, she has fought harder than almost everyone I know to stay clean. And so um, my mom is not the villain of my story. Um, and she's not the enemy. She's a victim of the enemy. So I just want to, before I continue, as I share this story, but one day when I was about four years old, we lived in this rundown apartment in San Jose, California, in downtown, and, and, and our apartment didn't have carpet. It was all concrete on the ground, and, and we didn't have beds. We were just on comforters on the ground, and we were four years old. And one day, my mom didn't come back. And we were just two four-year-old kids, and my sister was just this champ of a human who was comforting this crying four-year-old kid. And next thing you know, I don't have time to tell it all, but we ended up bouncing from relative to relative, home to home. And eventually, when we were 10 years old, we were bouncing around from foster home to foster home, group home to group home. And after each home, after each relative that that had kicked us out after each foster home that told us we couldn't stay. It continued to solidify and cement that narrative for me that I'm unwanted and unloved. My own parents couldn't, didn't want me. Who else would? Was the way I was thinking at the time. And through a series of coincidences and circumstances, by the way, I don't believe in coincidences, but uh, through a series of events, I ended up being in a home that was five houses down from a six foot two Canadian man and his five foot one Canadian wife. Their names were Rick and Pam. And the thing about Rick and Pam were uh, they were the nicest humans and they totally steered into the stereotype that Canadians are the nicest people on the planet. <laughs> They, they absolutely were just the most sweet people. But one thing I want you to hear is they totally embodied for me this idea of living intentionally. That is living on purpose and living with purpose. And to explain what I mean, they would take walks almost every day. It was just part of their daily routine. And, and I was the kid that didn't play with very many people outside. And I just would be outside with this flat basketball. I'd be bouncing it. And it would like, it would like a sack of potatoes just sit on the ground. And then I'd pick it up again and try again because... I'm dense like that. And <laughs> Rick and Pam would come out of their house, go on their walk every day. And, and at first, it just started for them with, hey, we're going to say hi to this kid. they say, hey, I'm Rick, I'm Pam. You know, they, they just went out of their way to care that I was there, that I existed. And as a foster kid, you have no idea what stranger danger is. No one stopped and taught a foster kid that. So I like, you know, was like, oh, hi, how are you? It just felt good to have an adult who was willing to come in and Notice that I was there. And day after day, Rick would come out of his house and be like, here, here, let me pump up that basketball for you. Or, or day after day, he'd be like, hey, Joe, Pam baked some cookies. Do you want some stuff? And eventually, I was running to his house to tell him about my day and being like, Rick, Pam, I, I got a C minus in math. How amazing is that? <laughs> but day after day, he went out of his way to say, I have an opportunity with this kid to care for him. It is not an accident that that kid moved five houses down from me. Through, again, I wish I had time to tell a series of circumstances, I ended up at that man's church and he was the pastor along with his wife. I had no idea, he didn't come up to me and be like, hi, I'm Pastor Rick, it is so nice to meet you. No, he just went on walks with his wife and was like, there's a kid here who needs to be loved and didn't fail any moment to say, I'm gonna take time out of my day to care for him. By the way, this is one reason why I'm such a huge fan of youth ministry because I have seen it lived out. I've seen a guy who's just really gone out of his way to say, I'm gonna love a kid who just is broken and I'm gonna love him radically. But long story short, I ended up being at his church going on a trip to Mexico. I thought it was supposed to be like a fun trip. Like when I heard of Mexico, I thought of like Cabo. <laughs> and I found out we were going to like work in orphanages and I was like as a kid who didn't grow up in the church you're like wait you guys sold me a false bill of goods here <laughs> where's my vacation <laughs> but I ended up encountering Jesus Christ 
and I was overwhelmed by his love, and it changed my life. And I remember I was on the floor of a, of a church much like this, and, and I just was like leaning, like just sitting there curled up, and I was like, Jesus, I don't know what it means to follow you. People keep saying that, and I don't know what it means, but if you show me what it means to follow you, I will follow you with the rest of my life. And he showed me every step of the way, and he has changed my life radically. I am not the same person. I'm not the foster kid up on this stage. Jesus has changed me. But I look back and I see that I am the product, really when I look back, of a guy who just was willing to go out of his way to live intentionally. He didn't just view his walks as, hey, you know, I'm just going on my merry way. He looked at every step he took on that walk as an opportunity to, to live life on purpose and with purpose. And the beautiful thing is, is he didn't even know what was gonna happen, but in doing so, it changed my life. He lived intentionally, and pumping up a basketball became not just a, it took a couple seconds, but it became a moment that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. This idea didn't orig originate with Rick, nor did it originate with people who do youth ministry or anyone else. This idea originated with, from God, from Jesus, who, who not one part of our story is wasted, not one part of our story is an accident. That he, he engages with us so intentionally, with so much purpose, that he ends up changing our lives using people who are intentional. And to show you what I mean, I wanna show you uh, Jesus living so intentionally uh, that it will shock you how intentional he is. Because when I ask you to think about the life of Jesus, what things pop into your head? And if you've been around church for any length of time, you're probably gonna be like, he fed 5,000 people, he calmed a storm, he, rose, he helped someone rise from the dead by just calling their name. Like, those are the stories we'll think of. But the thing is, is I think this story shows the most intentionality and Jesus just goes on a walk. Yeah, let me show you what I mean. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. And, and while you're turning there, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, at this point in the story, Luke is recording an eyewitness account of Jesus and his life. And, and Jesus came in and started teaching about how we value things in our, in our culture and in our world that are totally opposed to God's kingdom and how God's kingdom is all about not gaining more, but giving more, and, and caring about the least, the last, and the lost, and all of these things that upend the status quo, particularly the people in power. And so their goal is to kill him, and eventually they arrange a scenario where they do. And so they crucify him. All of his followers scatter, believing that this is a tragedy. What they don't realize is this was all a part of God's plan anyways, and that Jesus, in, in dying, was actually conquering but at this point in the story, he's risen from the dead, amazing, but that's not the part we're gonna focus on because what I want you to see is Jesus has risen from the dead and we would all think that he would like raise up into the sky and be like, hey everybody, I rose from the dead, super cool, huh? And instead I wanna show you what he does. Beginning in verse 13, that very day, that being Sunday where Jesus rose from the dead, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. So two people, one of them will be named in just a moment, his name's Cleopas. They're going on a walk uh, to Emmaus. We don't know where exactly that is, it's lost to us in time, but we do know uh, going over the hills of Jerusalem, it would take you about two hours to walk seven miles. But really what they're doing is they're on this walk and they're processing the trauma of what happened this weekend. They love Jesus, they put their hope in him, and now it feels gone. And they're processing all of this. And at this moment, if you were Jesus, what you would probably do is you would step up and you would say, hey, I rose from the dead, guys. Don't be sad anymore. But again, Jesus views this as a moment to be intentional. And look at what happens next. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, while they're in this moment of relationship, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, the, the obvious question to ask here is why were their eyes kept from recognizing him? And that's an appropriate question, but I think that the thing to ask is probably their eyes were kept from recognizing him because it was more important that they experienced who Jesus was than that they knew who he was. That they needed to experience something in this moment before they had the right answer or the right belief or the right theology. 
experiencing Jesus in this moment was the best thing they could have at this moment, more than Jesus revealing himself even. And so that's what Jesus does. And I want to highlight that Jesus drew near to them. And it even says, Luke records, he went with them. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he just was like nailed to a cross. After that, he's like, I'll walk seven miles with you. And he walks two hours with them. And notice what happens next. And he, Jesus, said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they still, they uh, stood still looking sad. They're bombed. They're devastated at this question. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he, being Jesus, said to them, what things? So they're like shocked because uh, during Passover weekend in Jerusalem in the ancient world in the first century, it would swell up, uh, it would add 250,000 people that day. It, it would triple in size that weekend. And so everyone saw the angry mob and the riots that were happening when Jesus was crucified. You, you would have to be like, you would have to be un, in, under a rock to not notice the things that have happened. That's why Cleopas is shocked. But what I want you to hear is Jesus already knows what happens. One, Jesus never asks a question that he doesn't know the answer to. But two, he's the guy who was crucified. <laughs> so why is he asking the question? And I think it's because Jesus is viewing this as a moment to live intentionally, with purpose. Because part of living intentionally is not only do you walk with the people God puts in your life, but two, you're asking questions. And I think sometimes, I know for me, I feel this pressure to step in when people are going through something and give them all the answers and say, this is what you need to do or this is how you need to think. And then what I've discovered is that the men and women who have changed my life the most have often been the ones that don't just try to fix me or give me answers, but they're the people that have asked questions and helped me discover where God's at work in my life, where Jesus is. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's just asking questions. He's entering into their world. He knows the answer. But by asking questions, he's saying, I want to know how you feel. And man, it's one of my favorite things to be with a high school student or a middle school student having a cup of coffee and saying, I, I, might, I might offer suggestions, but in this moment, all, all you need for me to do is just ask you questions about how you feel what you think, how do you see the world? And in doing so, we're being intentional. So Cleopas now goes into answering Jesus' question, what things? In verse 20, and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers, the religious people of that day, delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So just a couple of things. One, they don't believe Jesus has risen from the dead yet. It's some kind of hoax. Um, but I think the reason why is because of what you read in verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And I think that Cleopas here is tapping into one of the most painful parts about being a human being on our planet. That is that there's nothing that hurts worse than a, than a broken dream, a crushed expectation, a deferred hope. That for those of us, maybe you're a teenager in here and you're like, I really loved my boyfriend or girlfriend and I, I wanted to end up with them and the relationship still ended. Or for those of us who are like, I wanted my marriage to work. I fought hard. I did everything everyone said and it still fell apart. Or for those of us that are like, I really wanted that job. It was the first thing I tried for, and I still didn't get it. There's nothing that hurts worse on this planet, or few things that hurt worse on this planet, than a dashed hope. 
And I think Jesus has gone through this whole experience to care for them in this place. And that's what we see here is that now Jesus, notice everything Jesus has done. And again, I want us to have this idea in mind. Jesus at any point here could have just been like, I'm Jesus, I rose from the dead, awesome, huh? At any point he could have done that. Instead he walks seven miles, he walks two hours, he asks questions he already knows the answer to, and he listens. Isn't that beautiful? I can't think of anything more intentional than that. And if I had to pick any passage that describes the kind of youth ministry, that's my dream for Kesed Church, this is it. To have people who see the teenagers and young people at our church and say, there's an opportunity to walk with them and listen and ask questions, even if it means I go two hours out of my way and seven miles, I can love them. Isn't that beautiful? And notice by Jesus listening, by Jesus asking questions, by Jesus just walking with them at their pace, he's now able to speak into their life. Notice in verse 25, and he said to them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He's like, okay, let me, let me step in and just say like, hey, let me, let, let me help you guys understand here. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with the Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So just really quick, one, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. It means Jesus is this promised king that's gonna come and, and restore our broken world, bring justice, uh, destroy evil. And, and literally Jesus, again, they don't know it's Jesus yet. Jesus steps in and he's able to open up the entire Old Testament to them that the, the, the Jewish people would call it the Tanakh. And he's saying, let's mark, walk through and I will show you where, the, where Jesus is in the story. But we suddenly have this picture that Jesus is like sitting down and then opening his Bible and being like, let me, let me correct your answers here. But that's not what's happening. On this walk, he's saying, let me show you where the story you were just a part of is a part of a much larger story that's been a part of God's plan all along. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things we could do for people, is to say, let me show you where your story is a, large, is a part of a much larger story. I, I love when, I, when a teenager's eyes are starting to open and they recognize that they are a part of a, a, a meta-narrative that's coursing throughout human history. And their story gets to be woven into it. It gets to be a part of it, a, a part of the story that's so much bigger than ourselves. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, let me show you where the story, your pain, your heartache, your crushed dreams, let me show you how God's using that for something so much bigger than yourself. But the thing I want you to hear is he only gets that opportunity because he walked with them. He listened, he asked questions. That's what gave him the opportunity. And so notice what happens next in verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is towards the evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, that is in Emmaus. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. Uh, what I love here is, again, Jesus rose from the dead. At any point here, he could say, I'm Jesus, amazing. And instead, he chooses to walk seven miles. He chooses to listen to them as they are processing things that he already knew the answer to. And he's willing to even have a meal with them. That's what I call being intentional. He's not wasting a moment to be with them because their experience at this point is more important than having the right answer. Their, like, their relationship with him is more important than having right theology. And uh, a couple quick things here. One, um, if you ever get the chance to spend time with like Pastor Keith upstairs with the kids or downstairs or do any of our youth stuff, you'll, you'll always notice that there's lots of food. <laughs> One, because uh, young people are ravenous piranhas that just eat and eat and eat and eat. No, I'm just kidding. But no, because there's something really human and beautiful when we do something as basic as eating together. It drops our defenses. 
Uh, actually, the word for the word companion literally comes from the Latin words to break bread together. That is, that you want to know if you're really friends with someone, you'll grab a cup of coffee or, or lunch with them. And uh, so I love that that's a part of our, our kids and student ministries because there's something innate about that. But can I tell you something that's been so beautiful for me is that's what's happened to me here in my one month being at Kessid. The amount of people who have asked me and my family or to dinner or to coffee is insane. I've had so much coffee and so many cups of coffee that I go home and I'm like shaking and jittery. I tore apart my garage the other day <laughs> and then left it because I crashed on my couch. But all of that is just this beautiful picture of the fact that our church has this, this value of we're gonna do life together, we're gonna share meals together. That's part of being intentional. And in doing so, something beautiful happens here. They finally see who Jesus is. And you notice here, by the way, that in verse 30, uh, in verse 30 it says here, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And then they could see. But literally in the original language, in the Greek, and it's the same exact words in order as when he broke communion at the Last Supper. That is by just doing life with them, by having this simple meal, it pointed them to the meal where he said, hey, I love you so much that I'm gonna die for you. And when we're intentional, when, we go on, when we're willing to not waste the opportunity to walk with people, talk with people, listen to people, ask questions, have meals with them, suddenly they look back and they see Jesus. They see Jesus. Because Cleopas's experience is that when we are intentional, suddenly now we can see who Jesus is. And more than that, we can see where Jesus was and is in our story. And I look back in my life and I see the men and women who have been intentional with me, and I see Jesus. I see Jesus in my story with the social worker who picked me up from Glenview Elementary and was willing to give me a hug in the back seat of the car as I, I sat there crying. I see Jesus in the story, or I see Jesus in my story with my fifth grade teacher who saw this kid with head lice who was hurting and she just told him it's gonna be okay. I see Jesus in the story of the men and women who have said, I love you, you can come to my house for dinner, call me if you need. I see Jesus in the staff and elders here at Kesed who have gone out of their way to say you belong here, even though in my head I thought I didn't. And I see Jesus in, the, in my wife who daily is like, I forgive you and I love you. And I walk out of my house saying, I saw Jesus and he was a five foot three brunette woman with green eyes. <laughs> When we're intentional, people look back in their stories and they see Jesus. And it changes everything. How many of you have ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? Anyone here? Yeah. I didn't read it until I was uh, like late in high school, early college. But one of the books that, was, uh, that I started to read was uh, The Horse and His Boy. And this book deeply resonated with me. And actually, weirdly enough, it's like everyone's least favorite. And it was the one that I really liked. <laughs> But in the story, uh, Shasta, who's unrelated to the rest of the story or in any of the other books, is, is this kid who's orphaned from birth, ends up living with an abusive uncle in this fishing village, and, and long story short, he ends up going on this adventure to find a new and safe home in Narnia and meets friends along the way, but the journey is harrowing, it's, 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 it's difficult, it's tragic, and somewhere along the way, he ends up being in this dark forest by himself, pitch black, alone. And he begins to realize that there's been this creature that's walking with him. And he doesn't know how long the creature's been walking with him. And if you know much about the story, if you're reading, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, you know that whenever there's this lion present, he, he ends up being the personification of Jesus in the story. Shasta doesn't realize that it's the lion Aslan who's actually Jesus walking with him, but he just recognizes there's this creature next to him and he's terrified. And I just want to show you the interaction really quick. So he, Shasta, told how he had never known his real father or mother and how he had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. 
And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and of all their dangers in Tashban and about his night among the tombs and how the, the beasts out in the desert howled at him. And he told about the heat and thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded his friend Erebus and also how very long it was since he had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck to see so many lions, said Shasta? There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you that there were at least two lions the first night, and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know I was the lion? And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you as you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion who you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death, so that it came to the shore where your uncle, the fisherman, sat, wakeful at midnight to receive you. Who are you, asked Shasta? Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear. And then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it and yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. Shasta was no longer afraid that the voice belonged to something that would eat him, nor that it was the voice of a ghost, but a new and different sort of trembling came over him. He knew the night was over at last. He could see the mane and ears and head of his horse quite clearly now. A golden light fell on them from the left. He thought it was the sun. He turned and saw pacing beside him the whole time, taller than the horse, a lion. The horse did not seem to be afraid of it or else it could not see it. It was from the lion that the light came. No one ever saw anything more terrifying or more beautiful. But after one glance at the lion's face, Shasta slipped out of the saddle and fell at Aslan's feet. He couldn't say anything, but then he didn't want to say anything. He knew he didn't need to say anything. This story is so beautiful to me because Aslan is giving Shasta a glimpse that at every aspect of his story, Aslan was there. And like the Emmaus Road story, I think when we're intentional, we look back and we see Jesus. When, when Jesus is revealed to Cleopas and his friend, they literally say, did not our hearts burn? We knew it was him. We just couldn't see it at the time. It was only when they looked back and when we're intentional, one day people will look at their story. They'll even be told their story by Jesus. And he'll say, you know, that, you know that nice teacher? That was me. You know that coach? That was like, I'll drive you home. That was me. You know how your best friend's parents were willing to take care of you, give you dinner every night? That was me. You know how that coworker was willing to, to show you the ropes? Yeah, that was me. And when we look back on our story, we'll be like, I saw Jesus, he was all over it. And being intentional doesn't have to cost much. It honestly can just start with pumping up a flat basketball. It could start with, hey, I'm just gonna say hi to that kid on my walk. You see, Rick and Pam, uh, they became a much larger part of my story. Uh, when I was about a senior in high school, the f home I was in was going through a terrible divorce and it was falling apart and uh, we were going to have to move. And uh, through a long series of circumstances throughout late high school, early college, Rick and Pam opened their home to me. And then they unofficially adopted me. And I remember even Rick was driving me to move in to the college I was going to on, on campus. And I was in the car with them and, and I was like, hey, Rick, because this is the kind of question that foster kids ask, like, uh, when does this whole like relationship end? And he was like, if you want it to, it can end right now. 
And I was like, I don't want that at all. And then just looking straight ahead, he said, then Joe, I am committed to you for the rest of my life. And that was the first time I had ever heard a human being say that to me. And what's beautiful is Rick also officiated the wedding where the second person in my life told me that she would commit to me forever. This relationship started because of a flat basketball. But man, when we're willing to be intentional and go out of our way, something beautiful happens. It ripples out and Jesus shows up in our stories and in their stories. And maybe one day we'll get to heaven and someone will say, yeah, you remember that one moment? I'm here because of you. And I'm excited to see that happen with our student ministries. And I'd love it if you'd pray about being a part, any part, <laughs> big or small, because it doesn't take much. One of my dreams is, is that within 10 miles of this building, there's not a coffee shop within 10 miles of here that doesn't have at least once that week an adult who is willing to have a cup of coffee with a student and ask questions and just be there. But it doesn't take much. It could be a $2 cup of coffee. It could be filling up a flat basketball. It can even be a 35 cent donut. And so normally we would end our time with a song. And as much as I do love that time, we didn't want us to miss the opportunity to do life with purpose, to be intentional. So y'all are getting a free donut. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask that you don't just grab your donut and walk out the doors. Because it's not an accident that the folks in this room are here. That's on purpose. God does everything intentionally. And when we're intentional, we get to come alongside what he's doing. And so take your donut, much like this one, and go find someone that you don't know and have a conversation because it could change their life. It could start something that changes everything. So eat that donut, hang out. There'll be a timer on the screen. I'll dismiss us at the end and enjoy a conversation with someone on purpose. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hope you're enjoying your conversations and your donut. Um, if you uh, head back to your seat, and then can you stand with me really quick? I just want to say being intentional, living life on purpose, it doesn't take much. It literally, honestly, could just be a donut and a conversation. But man, you could be a part of change in someone's life. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, thank you that you've been intentional with us. No part of our life is wasted or on accident. And that when we are intentional, you invite us in. So Lord, just pray you, you give us eyes to see opportunities this week to take our minutes and make them into moments that change lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. Love you guys. See you next week. <laughs>